time, I enjoy reading and writing and cooking. That was something I really got into over touring. So I am 21 years old. I finished college, um, but my tech journey started back in high school. I was very lucky enough to have a journey into tech opportunities and I'll kind of walk you, guys, walk you all through that. So <laughs> back in high school when I was an underclass, so freshman, sophomore year, I kind of didn't really know what I was going to do. I started off thinking that I was going to go into architecture, which if you don't know, is the design uh, process for buildings and maybe urban planning. Um, I personally live in New York City and I thought it would be really cool to leave my mark on the skyline by designing buildings. Um, so because of that, I joined ACE, which was this, um, what it, which is an architecture construction engineering mentorship program. Um, and so for me, I got to learn more about the architectural process as well as construction management and engineering. And as soon as I learned more about architecture in that you have to go through a very lengthy um, licensing process and take some exams and be an apprentice, uh, I kind of wasn't up for that. I didn't really want to have to wait to claim um, my own work because if you don't have a license, you can't find your own work. Uh, and so for me, that's really important to make sure that everybody knows that I did something. Um, and I also realized that I didn't really enjoy architecture as much as I thought I would. Um, it wasn't as, I wasn't as drawn into it um, by styling buildings. And so I kind of, after freshman, sophomore year, I was really lost in terms of what I wanted to do, um, both in terms of a college major, but then in my career after. Um, so then I was lucky enough to be a part of Girls Who Code in 2014, um, so in the first couple of years of the session. This was the summer before my junior year, so I had only taken one computer science class before then because my high school required it. Um, we had to take an intro to computer science class in order to graduate. I, at the time, did not actually enjoy coding because it seemed very mathematical. It seemed... Um, I couldn't really understand the applications for it. And so I was essentially forced by my parents to apply for Girls of Code just so I had something to do over the summer. Um, and I really thought it was going to be just another summer school program. Um, and I was definitely not psyched about it at all. But I joined, I got in, and uh, I was completely wrong. My assumptions were completely um, untrue. I went in for seven weeks with. 20 other women um, who are interested in computer science who had various levels of coding experience from never working with computer at all to having taken AP computer science. And it was really fun to work alongside them to learn all these coding concepts, but then also have the emotional support of failing and succeeding along with these girls. Um, and I'm actually still friends with a lot of them to this day, which is really amazing. And so the best thing about Girls Who Code for me was that I actually learned what computer science entailed. I understood what coding could be applied to. Um, and I was really excited about that. I saw that I could be a web developer, an app developer. I could work in hardware. I could um, work in database management. There, the possibilities were endless. And um, it always thrilled me to code because I didn't really understand what was happening, right? You write a single line of code and some something pops up or a function is called that was crazy to me and so for me that was kind of the jumping off point for my interest in tech um, and that's really the impetus of where I ended up today um, so then after girls who code I uh, junior and uh, senior year of high school I really dove into computer science I was, again, lucky enough to go to a high school with computer science classes, so I was able to take both AP, but then classes past AP um, in uh, Python development and C development, so I got a taste of web dev as well as lower level programming. I also got into the hackathon world. If you're not familiar with what a hackathon is, it's a coding competition, essentially, where over the course of a set amount of time, so 12 hours, 24 hours, 48 hours, you work with a team to develop a project. And I really loved that because it kind of took what I did during Girls Who Code. I was able to apply my skills and build something. Um, and so I first attended a couple of hackathons, but then started organizing my, them myself. 
So I became very entrenched in the tech world here in New York City. Um, and I soon learned that I enjoyed coding, but I wanted something more. Um, and that's what ultimately led me into electrical and computer engineering, which I'll delve into in a little bit. So yeah, after high school, typically comes college. So for me, I ended up applying and getting into Cornell University, but I'll walk you through some of the questions that I had as I was going through the college application process. So the first was, where will I go? Um, I think that's the question on almost every high schooler's mind, um, especially with how competitive college applications are. But for me, especially because I'm the oldest of my family, uh, I wasn't entirely sure where geographically I was going to go. Um, I've always lived in New York City. I have always felt comfortable in the city, so I didn't know if I was going to the East Coast, if I was going to go to a more rural area, if I was going to go all the way to California or uh, maybe Scotland. Uh, that was something I told my parents I was interested in doing, and they were like, no. Um, so there was a lot of opportunities for me for college. Um, but ultimately, I decided to go to Cornell University. Um, and so Cornell is located in uh, upstate New York in this tiny little town called Ithaca. Um, it's very different than New York City. It is a population of 10,000, I believe, without college students. And when I first got there, I was pretty scared about what I was going to face, mainly because I have always been used to uh, the possibilities that a city provides. You know, if it's 2 a.m. and you're hungry, you can walk around the corner to a CPS or something or to a bodega. The, there's a lot for you to be able to do. And for me, my friends and I never really spent time with our colleges. We always went out to restaurants or to movies or walked around the park, um, which was completely different from the more suburban rural lifestyle that most people find in Um But for me, it was the perfect balance between independence and closeness to my family. So Ithaca is around five hours to New York City. So it meant that if my parents wanted to come visit me, they had to plan in advance. But it also meant that if I had anything important in the city or if there was an emergency, um, either one of us could jump on a bus and go back home very quickly. Um, so it was nice because I was able to kind of have my own space, establish myself as an adult, while also being relatively close to my family just as well. Um, then the next question was, how will I spend my time? You know, like, what do you do in college? Because there's a lot of stereotypes about how you spend your time in college. There's the stereotype that you're going to be a nerd, right? You're going to spend all your time in academics. You're going to be constantly studying in your library. Um, you're going to go to bed at 3 a.m. Uh, and it's just going to be constant stress. But then there's also this, the other stereotype where um, you might be partying all the time and you don't care about school and you're kind of just there to have fun, meet new people, and have the best four years of your life the stereotype of college. Um, for me, I was lucky enough to have a combination of academics and a bunch of other things. So academically, I have taken a ton of courses. I'll go a little bit more into them later. But for me, I've been able to take courses not only in engineering, but then also in liberal studies. So humanities, English, language. Um, so I get to become a well-rounded student while also pursuing the career that I ultimately know I want to go into. In terms of extracurriculars, I've been lucky enough to be in a member of a bunch of organizations as well as a leader in a couple organizations. And for me, that's allowed me to pursue my passions of uh, diversity in STEM, of writing, of connecting with other people, of, TA, of teaching other people. And um, it's something that allows me to take my mind off of academics. Right? I often actually spend time working on my clubs instead of doing homework. Um, and it's because I truly enjoy the work that I do and I also truly enjoy the people that I work with. In terms of social life, um, the great thing about Cornell and I think about a lot of other colleges is that it's a place for many different types of people to coalesce. So when I came to Ithaca, I thought I knew every kind of person. New York City is one of the most diverse places on earth. I kind of thought I'd seen it all, but I realized as soon as I got to Cornell that there were different identities, people I had never interacted with, 
there are people in different states in America that I had never met. I had never met anybody from Wisconsin, which is the most kind of uh, <laughs> innocuous thing. But for me, it just seemed really important to get to know people from different walks of life, from different backgrounds. Um, and it was really awesome. And it, it's been great because I've been able to not only connect with these people and learn more about um, how, what they're, they've experienced growing up, and the differences and similarities between my growing up in the city and them being from wherever they're from. But I've also been able to use them as a sounding board, as an idea generator for any of the passion projects I've worked on or the classes I've been a part of. Um, and that's always really nice because I think something we all know about diversity is the wider range of people you have involved in your life or in your projects or in your company, the wider range of ideas you're going to have, the more impactful they're all going. So that's something that I've been very lucky enough to have um, and I hold near and dear to my heart. And then exploring Ithaca. I think the nice thing about Ithaca is that because it's so out of the way, um, there's literally nowhere else for you to go unless you want to take a bus somewhere. And so I've been able to go and explore the town. They have a ton of different restaurants and cafes. And, um, the thing about Ithaca is that there's a lot of nature walks. And so that's not something that I'm always used to in the city. I haven't really gone on hikes here. I haven't really driven to see a waterfall that often. And so when you're stuck in the middle of upstate New York, you have all those opportunities. And for me, that was awesome because it was a different lifestyle that I wasn't accustomed to, despite it being literally in the same state. Um, so yeah, these are all the things that I've been a part of at Cornell. So Alpha Meg Epsilon is the engineering sorority that I founded, um, as well as um, have been in since freshman year. And so for me, being a part of an engineering sorority has been really powerful just because it means that you have a group of women who are all interested in technical sciences and engineering and who can all build off of each other and interact with people that they most likely wouldn't have met because like, for example, I'm an electrical engineer. I'm ne not necessarily going to work directly with chemical engineers, but by being a part of the sorority, I've been able to meet other people like that. Women in Computing at Cornell is a pretty similar organization, except it's a lot bigger, and it's focused more on computer science and information science. Um, and so that's been able to um, fulfill more of the coding, software engineering, design side of my passion. Um, then I've been a teaching assistant, which if you're not aware for college means that they assist the professor in teaching. So they'll run office hours, they'll help uh, grade papers or um, give one-on-one -on -one tutoring. And so for me, I always love teaching people and being able to teach someone else actually helps reinforce concepts. For me. So that's something I've been doing since around sophomore year. I've also been an undergraduate researcher, so I, um, work for the Collective Embodied Intelligence Lab, which is a lab run by Professor Kirsten Peterson on um, soft robotics and other autonomous uh, robots. And that's really awesome for me, just because that's actually what my master's is going to be focused in. So being able to work on robots, um, building them myself, as well as um, testing out different designs has been a really great learning experience. Uh, and then I mentioned before, coursework, friends, the courses I've been able to take have been from a wide range of disciplines. And then again, the friends that I've uh, gained along the way have been extremely diverse and have really made Cornell, I think, uh, the place that I love so much. So a lot of people in the registration form were asking me about different names. So I'm, again, electrical and computer engineering. But normally when you think of that, you also are drawn to computer science or electrical engineering, or computer engineering. Um, I was kind of in that boat where I wanted a combination of all three majors, but I'll also go into um, depth as to why I would chose electrical computer engineering. So first you have computer science. This was actually what I intended to major in at the start of Girls in Code. Um, I really enjoyed coding. And I thought that that's what computer science in college was going to be. Um, instead, I realized it's more of a theoretical major. Um, it means when, when I say theoretical, I mean that you spend more time proving algorithms mathematically. You learn about the theory of using different data structures, like how fast they are, how efficient they are in terms of space. 
Um, you can also learn about uh, how programming languages are actually made um, in terms of how fast they are to compile, uh, how accessible they are to other people, how accessible are they to humans in general, um, as well as the system of a computer. So making computers theoretically faster and making your program theoretically work faster than that system. Um, the great thing about computer science though is that after you learn that theory, you can dive into any sort of application you want. So you can go further into academia, so you can do research or become a professor, but then you could also go into industry. And so some fields that incorporate the field of computer science are artificial intelligence, um, graphics, computer vision, cryptography, databases, networks, and game design. Um, so for me, the reason I didn't choose computer science was because in your first couple of years of uh, college, you actually have to take foundational courses um, to establish the knowledge that you're going to throughout the major. And so for computer science, a lot of those courses ended up being theoretical. And for me, my focus was on building things, getting my hands dirty, working in a lab. And I didn't really see myself doing that as a computer scientist. However, what you do learn and what you do gain from all those theories um, or theoretical applications is a lot of information to be put towards leading edge technology. So new fields like AI, like graphics, and computer vision, which is always really exciting because you're kind of on the cusp of what's new in technology. Then there's also electrical engineering. So electrical engineers focus more on the nitty gritty nuts and bolts of how electricity actually flows through a system. Um, and then ultimately that system going to power on your program whatever a computer scientist is So that focuses on uh, circuits, devices, and materials. So um, for example, a chip, a computer chip in the back of your phone. Uh, what material is it made out of? Can it be smaller? Can it be thinner? Um, radio frequencies, so learning about um, AM and FM radio, but then also telecommunication, which is, involves 3G, so the uh, ability for you to make a phone call to someone. And there's also 4G and now 5G, so the increase in data being able to be sent between devices. Um, Otronics, which is the study of photons, um, which, is based, which are basically light particles, um, because once you harness that energy, you're able to run your actual system. And then power engineering, which is the distribution of power throughout a system. So making sure that, for example, if you have multiple cores in the computer, that they're all going to be receiving the adequate power they need in order to run whatever programs are being put onto that computer for. Um, so the, in electrical engineering, you're focusing more on equations. You're basing yourself more on physics. So uh, AP physics, e &M. that's what a lot of electrical engineering is focused on in terms of foundational equations and knowledge you need to have. So fields for electrical engineers include hardware, power electronics, electromagnetics, nanotechnology, electrochemistry, renewable energies, mechatronics, and material science. So they, in general, focus more on the hardware that's used to build a computer or a computer chip or a robot arm or any other um, physical harness that potentially computer scientists or software engineer will load a program onto in order for it to function. And then there's computer engineering. So computer engineering, in terms of the tech stack, um, is a, between computer science and electrical engineering. So electrical engineering, if you think about it, is super low on the tech stack. It's focused more on the actual transfer of electricity, um, the actual circuits being built, whereas computer science, to, science is more about higher level applications. So writing code. Um, so something that's not necessarily as physical, but will be eventually loaded onto the devices that electrical engineers work on. Computer engineers fit a little bit between those two. So they work on digital and computer systems. So there's something within a computer that helps compile the programs that you're writing into what's called machine code. Um, so binary, ones and zeros. And computer engineers help that process along so that when computer scientists and software engineers write a Python program, for example, the computer is able to understand and interpret that. Um, embedded processors. So an embedded system is whenever you have a chip um, embedded into something else. 
So you can think about how um, wearable tech is becoming a very big industry right now. You have smart watches, um, you have drones, you have smart homes. Embedded processors are just small chips in a physical device. So they have to be reliant on their own power source. They also have to be able to potentially connect to Wi-Fi. So those are things that can guarantee you focus on. Uh, digital signal processing. So for example, when you are um, editing an image, right? You're turning it to black and white. It has to receive that image and then change every pixel accordingly so that it's black and white. For, so for an X-ray, for example, specific points of activity are highlighted appropriately. Those are all signals. The pixels themselves are all individual signals. And so a computer engineer can help process those to make sure that um, they're turned a certain color. Or in terms of music, they are uh, filtering out a specific sound. Uh, and then robotics, I think kind of self-explanatory. So working with robotic devices, kind of similar to embedded processors, except that robots tend to be a little bit larger. So they can be anything from a robotic arm on assembly line to potentially those talking robots that uh, like clean your house and answer your questions from the internet. Um, and then computer architecture. Computer architecture is the underlying structures within the computer itself um, to help run different tasks. So what I mean by that is that when a computer program is received, it will try to handle as many programs at once or at once, quote unquote. Uh, it tries to make sure that it's distributing its processing power to Facebook and your internet browser and Slack and your Zoom call without your computer completely wheezing and going dark. Um, so computer architects help that process happen so that the right data is sent around appropriately um, and essentially making it so any person using a computer or other other electronic device does not realize how hard the computer is actually working to display everything. Um, so similar to computer science and electrical engineering, some of the fields actually include hardware, um, but then they'll also include processors, digital memory, networks, computer security, AVs, Internet of Things, and robotics. So that was a lot, but then there's electrical and computer engineering, which in my unbiased opinion, uh, is the perfect combination of all three of those. Uh, so you get a nice taste of computer science, computer engineering, and electrical engineering. You get to learn about circuits, so the actual voltages and currents running through different var various systems. You also get to learn about signal processing. Um, you also deal with um, physics of electromagnetism and how that will power uh, your computer or whatever other electronic device. But then you'll also learn about embedded systems. So being able to um, write code to be run on a board like an Arduino or Raspberry Pi um, and actually work between the interface of hardware and software to get a task. Some other upper level electives um, these are where electrical and computer engineers will diverge into specific fields. So I know a lot of ECDs who go full on electrical engineering. They will start designing circuit boards. They will start looking into power distributions on uh, city grids, for example. But then I also know people who will go into um, like FinTech and they'll be coding for um, quantum computing companies or Google, right? Um, the more traditional software engineering. And that's where you kind of, in the upper level electives, that's kind of where you figure out what path you really want. Um, so for example, I personally am interested in more embedded systems in robotics. I really love coding and working with hardware simultaneously. So I've really enjoyed uh, this course that I took called uh, microelectronics, where I was able to build various um, little robots, uh, code them, and then also build the side circuits for them for any sense of design. Uh, so if you're planning on going in more of an electrical engineering lower level perspective, you might look into analog circuits or power systems. If you're thinking about doing um, more computer science, you might look into the fundamentals of machine learning. 
or um, telecommunication. And then if you're planning on doing computer engineering, you might look into uh, computer architecture, architecture or digital feedback. So the nice thing about ECE, in my opinion, is that you don't necessarily have to go down one strict path to stay within um, only circuits or only Python programming or only uh, computer architecture. You're able to try out a bunch of different fields within the tech stack um, and then eventually put them together into what you want to do. So for me, when I was thinking about what I wanted to do for my master's, since that's more of a focused approach, I looked back at all the classes that I wanted to take and a lot of them were focused on robotics. Uh, and so then I realized, okay, I've learned a lot about all these different fields in circuitry and computer architecture and signal processing. But now I want to actually put them all together and build a robot. Um, and so by taking those upper level courses, I've been able to kind of discern my more specific focus within. So now after becoming electrical and computer engineer within college, I've actually done a bunch of internships, which has been amazing. Internships for me have been a very big learning resource. I've been able to um, gain insights on the job that I wouldn't necessarily do in a classroom. And I've also been able to take what I've learned in the classroom and apply to my job. It's great, it's a great cycle. Um, so my first internship was way back in 2015 when I was still in high school. I worked for Build by Girls, which if you're not familiar with it, it's a brand owned by OS, formerly AOL, um, that is, all about empowering women to pursue whatever career they want, but it's more focused towards tech careers. Um, so back then, Built by Girls was a, helped run an internship program where they took Girls Who Code alumni um, and had them work on a website. Uh, that website did not exist anymore, but it was called Cambio.com. I was able to learn about front end development, so I was in charge with a couple of their interns on redesigning a video page this website where hundreds of thousands of users touched every month um, and for me that was mind-blowing that they would give that responsibility to a 17 year old because I had never had that much responsibility in my entire life um, and on the other side I also got to learn about business strategies so I got to understand um, marketing campaigns advertising and all the things that go into making a website actually possible um, because it's one thing to actually design a page that visit videos and interact with them. There's another thing to actually make money on that. And I was lucky enough to get such an early exposure to the concept of monetizing platforms. So it's not something that's completely foreign. The next summer, so the summer before college, before I was a freshman in college, I worked at IAC. Uh, IAC is a company that owns a bunch of different brands, including uh, college, college humor, uh, Tinder, OkCupid, um, and Ask.com. I specifically worked for Ask.com, uh, which, if you're not as old as me, was a website where you used to, I guess, what you would call Google things. Um, back then, you would just search different, uh, <laughs> you search different topics. Um, you'd ask questions to Ask.com, and answer. And for me, I was in charge of making sure that all of their uh, Chrome extensions. Uh, were correctly deployed to servers around the world because it was, you don't want a user in Los Angeles to see a different Chrome extension than a user in Tokyo, for example. Um, so I was kind of a quality assurance engineer, meaning that I was ensuring that whenever a new push, uh, a new update to a Chrome extension was sent out to servers, that every server got it and that there was an email once every server got it. So all the engineers on the team knew that they were all on the same. Um, I also had a brush with product development because on the side, while I was working on the server project, all the interns at IAC were asked to work together to make their own product. We ended up working on an iOS app that would take a photo of your face and then display a certain GIF based on your emotion. So if it was happy, it would show happy and stuff. Um, but if you were sad, it might uh, show a meme of a woman crying. Um, and so we got to work with new technologies, but then also work on trying to create an end-to-end -end product. We actually ended up pitching it to the executives at IAC, um, which was really amazing because we got to 
kind of walk them through our process and why we thought it might be a good product. We ended up not pursuing it, but that was my first brush with dealing with executives and having ownership over a product, and it really felt great. Uh, so then next year, so I was now in college, I worked for Growth to Code, amazing company. I really wanted to give back to the organization had to get, who had given me so much and had started my career in that. So I was one of their two interns who was focused on software engineering products for alumni. What that meant was I was, again, in charge of my own product. I had to do user research for Girls of Code alumni. You might have remembered, if you're old enough, you might remember me poking around on Facebook and asking questions. That was me conducting user research about what kind of product alumni want. Um, then me and a fellow intern were charged with um, designing the different pages for it, outlining the different technologies we were going to use pitching that to the Girls Who Code team to get their approval, and then building an outer self. Um, it was an event finder, so once Girls Who Code alumni had graduated from the program, they would be able to find hackathons, or workshops, or talks related to different areas of tech, um, as shown on Eventbrite or StubHub. It never got rolled out, but again, it was just a really great opportunity for me to understand more about the product cycle and what steps are actually taken to make sure that a product fulfills a user need um, in an efficient way, um, but then also an aesthetic way and a functionally correct way. So then after that, I started changing my trajectory a little bit to be focused more on ECE careers. So Qualcomm is a telecommunications company. Um, they actually invented or we're pioneers of the technology that we rely on to call each other on the cell phone. Um, and that was really crazy because it was a chip making, they're a chip making company that's present in almost every single phone. Um, they are always at the forefront of technology for different forms of telecommunication. So 5G was something that they had been working on when I was an intern. Um, and for me, that was really cool because it was a new technology, but it was also one that I think everybody kind of takes for granted to some extent. You know, I never thought about why my phone was only at 4G LTE or only at 3G when I was in a certain area. I just kind of always assumed that if I sent a text, it would eventually come. So at Qualcomm, I was actually part of their 4G LTE test team, which meant that they tested chips for companies. Um, to make sure that they had the adequate additional features that the company had asked for, but then also the core functionality of being able to have a 4G LTE data transfer. Um, and I was in charge of making sure that their error messages in these tests were displayed in an actually readable way. Because before it was just thousands of, long, <laughs> thousands of lines of log files, um, and it was almost impossible to figure out what error you were looking for but I helped display all these errors in a line graph so they could see where exactly in the test uh, the device had failed and what they had to look at. So I was able to work on this new product, uh, this new internal tool, while also learning more about telecommunications and how um, messages are transferred via Bluetooth, or via text message, via um, a cell phone call. Uh, and that was really cool because it was, again, my first foray into a more electrical and computer engineering role, even though I was still focusing on coding as part of my career. And then was last summer, I went to Microsoft and I was an electrical engineering intern. And this was really exciting for me because, first of all, Microsoft, uh, it's a company that my parents actually knew existed, which was a big plus for me. I didn't have to answer many questions on their end. But then I was also an electrical engineer for them. Um, and I was specifically working on their surface line of computers, which is a relatively new portion of the company. So I wasn't working in the super established uh, like Windows operating system or Microsoft Office part of the company. I was working within devices, which essentially was a little bit of a startup within Microsoft because they were kind of always trying to scrap together new products, new product lines, and prove themselves within the very competitive space of uh, computer hardware. 
And I specifically was on the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth test team. So again, I was working more within the realm of telecommunication. My job was to write a testing protocol for these Surface laptops to see how well um, Wi-Fi connections work when the device was turned off and then turned back on, or once it got too far away from the network that I was connected to and had to be on that one. Um, and for me, that was kind of a new step from Qualcomm, where I was actually interacting directly with these telecommunication protocols and being able to see the messages that the devices would send to each other saying, oh, no, I, I am not detecting this current Wi-Fi network. Oh, okay, I found this new one. Let me authenticate it. Let me connect to that. And being able to read those messages and interpret them and then also write the protocol to spit out information about them and analyze that uh, was again, just a new jump further into electrical engineering. Um, and for me, working at Microsoft was an absolute dream. I uh, met a ton of very intelligent, very capable interns and have done so at every internship that I've been a part of. But for me, Microsoft, especially because it's such a, for the most part, philanthropically minded company, it meant that I was working for a company that actually cared about society to some extent, more so than other tech companies I've known about. Um, and that was always really important for me, because especially given that I'm a person of relative privilege, I'm a, uh, a highly educated white woman, I have the choice to work at whatever company I want to potentially. I might have to work harder to get to some, but I'm going to have a good job, which I'm very grateful. But that means that I have the responsibility to work for companies that are ethically minded, that are not necessarily uh, like working directly with prisons or government contracts. And even though Microsoft is not completely perfect, um, the philanthropic endeavors that I saw them do saw that they were moving in the right direction. And so for me, that was very important. And ultimately, why I decided to take that internship at Microsoft, in addition to just the amazing projects I was going to work. And now this summer, I am at Lyft, specifically level five, which is their autonomous vehicle department. I work as a hardware engineer on self-driving vehicles. Um, I specifically am lear uh, learning more about the machine learning that goes into the car actually detecting objects around it. Um, so being able to detect the curb, for example, or pedestrian passing in front of it. Um, so then eventually later on, the car can then plan its movement. I could see if it sees a pedestrian, then it knows that it has to figure out where that pedestrian is going. Is it going to walk in front of the car? Is it someone who stopped at a red light? Um, in order to make sure that it moves appropriately when uh, moving from point A to point B. And so for me, that's really awesome just because I think for self driving cars, it's, it's not something that any of us have really experienced before. No one has really worked on self driving cars, no one has really ridden in a self driving car. So this is the perfect example of cutting edge technology that you can work on as an electrical and computer engineer because we're constantly learning more about what tech can do what you can do with software what you can do with hardware um, and for me self-driving cars is the perfect blend of that and although it's not necessarily working in telecommunications or working in robotics it's one of those industries that i think could potentially change the world change how we interact with people change how um, we interact with transportation, maybe reduce the number of cars on the road, especially now that Lyft is um, committing to electric vehicles. Um, it could potentially uh, reduce our carbon footprint on the world, considering how many people drive cars. Um, and being a part, again, of some of an ethically minded company that's trying to bring people together without uh, causing too much damage to the world that we live in, um, it's really fun. And I'm only four weeks into my pro uh, into my internship, but I have learned a ton about how the car works, about how my project will help future iterations of the car. And I've been given a lot of responsibility as an intern because I'm one of 40 within the level five division. Um, and that has been, that has meant a lot, especially considering that this is such a new field. Uh, and that they're trusting me with uh, technology that will go into a self-driving car. Uh, so yeah, TLDR, I've been having a great time at work so far. Um, and now, a lot of 
you all sent questions um, in the registration form, so I'm going to answer a couple of the popular ones. Uh, so one was, what kind of people like ECE? Um, so I kind of went off of who I am as a person in that people who enjoy ECE enjoy building. Um, they love coding, they, they appreciate software, but they also appreciate hardware. They want to learn more about how um, electricity actually controls the computer, how um, messages are sent through the air to send information through the internet. Um, they kind of want to delve farther into multiple layers of the tech stack, not just a super high level look or a super low level. Um, another question is, can ECE be combined with other fields? Um, and I think that's just the beautiful thing about tech in general, is that it's very uh, fluid. You can be an electrical and computer engineer in a car company, right, designing self driving cars. But you can also be an electrical and computer engineer working at a hospital to help develop um, prosthetics for amputees, or you can work within the sports field to maybe do better analysis on the uh, like how many, uh, like how well a baseball player bats or something like that. Um, so the answer is yes. EC can be combined with other fields, especially now that tech is becoming more ubiquitous and it's becoming something that even the most non-technical fields are relying on. Uh, a big one was, do you need to be a coding expert? And a thousand percent, you do not, you do not need to know how to code, first of all, to go into college. That's a big thing. But you also don't even need to be a coding expert to be a professional electrical and computer engineer. Uh, I am lucky enough to know how to code, but that's also something I'm interested in. I enjoy coding. Um, but it wasn't a prerequisite for my position. A prerequisite for my position was knowing more about um, computer architecture. And that's not necessarily something that's related to coding. Um, I also have friends who are, again, are, are electrical, and electrical engineers. So they're focused on building circuits and uh, solving physics equations. And they do, definitely do not need to know Python to do that. Um, so you definitely don't need to be a coding expert. But even if you do want to go into a role that is more focused on coding, you still don't need to be a coding expert because a lot of what you learn, um, you can learn on the job. You can also learn um, by yourself, not necessarily in a college course, um, by doing a side project or taking a course there or something like that. Um, and especially once you know the fundamentals of one coding language, it can be applied to as many other coding languages as you want. Uh, it's kind of what I think about the engineering mindset. Engineering is not necessarily about learning specific skills um, or specific equations. It's more about learning how to work in a team, collaborate with others, be analytical when it comes to approaching a problem. Um, not necessarily do you understand uh, <laughs> V equals IR, um, or do you understand how this specific cache will uh, be hit when you request information. Like those are very technical things that you don't necessarily need to know, it's useful, but it's more a drive to learn um, and the overall uh, passion for engineering and building. Again, so recommended resources, I mentioned Coursera. I'm actually taking a couple of Coursera courses. One is from the University of Toronto on self-driving cars. So if you wanna do that completely free, unless you want a certificate, um, I'm not doing a certificate, so you can just like watch the lectures, which is really fun. Um, I'm also taking a Coursera course on machine learning from Andrew Ng, NG, from Stanford um, for my uh, work at Lyft, and so that's been really informational as well. Uh, but then there's also great YouTube tutorials, there's great blogs. Um, I, for example, am working on an iOS app this summer, and I don't know how, to, I don't really remember how to code in Swift, and so I've been relying a lot on other tutorials and other people's YouTube videos to work ahead and develop track of the product. Um, so the internet is your friend. Um, typically, if you Google anything, you will find a free resource um, to help you get ahead. Uh, and then a any favorite projects? So I've worked on a bunch um, because I do a lot of projects within college. Uh, that's the great thing about being an engineer, you actually build a lot. Um, my favorite, my favorites, so Autonomous Robot, I had to build a 
robot that would solve a maze. Um, it was for a competition to see which robot would solve the maze the fastest. Um, my team did not win, but the TAs thought we were going to, and so we got a spirit award for that, which was really nice. Um, because it showed that we worked the best as a team and had not some last minute technical failures happened, we probably would have had a good shot at winning. Um, Self-driving vehicles, so for me, what I've been doing on Lyft, uh, which is learning a lot about the machine learning that goes into a car, um, something I never thought about. Uh, and now I've, I've been able to actually delve deeper into the function of our car, what uh, Lyft's current prototypes are. Uh, and then Franklin, this was in a Raspberry Pi project I made. Um, Oh, and the autonomous robot was made using an Arduino. So Arduino and Raspberry Pi are both relatively cheap boards that you can build, um, or not build, you can buy and then build circuits for code programs on, which is awesome. So they're, uh, they're really good for kind of plug and play work and prototyping. Franklin was a Raspberry Pi based device to take care of your pet while you were away. It was made as a final project for a course. It uh, played fetch, so it threw a ball it deposited food at a specific time, and then it also had this weird looking uh, cardboard arm to pet your pet, theoretically. It was terrifying. It was made in uh, the motor of a fan, like one of those box fans. So it definitely would not be good around to pet, uh, but it was a thought that counts. And I thought that was really fun to work with a bunch of different sensors. Um, and then any advice for internships? So don't get scared of job requirements, especially if you are, um, a woman or any other minority within tech, um, you typically have the bias that if you don't, it's actually proven statistically that women are less likely to apply for a job if they only have 50% of the requirements, whereas men, uh, most likely uh, white cisgender them, will, if they have at least 50% of the requirements, will go for it. They'll, they're like, ah, oh, whatever, the worst they can say is no. Um, so that's what I would have say to you. If you see a job that you're interested in, even if you don't fulfill all the requirements, worst they can say is no. You'll learn a lot by maybe going through the interviewing process. And I've actually gone through interviewing processes where they've noticed that I've lacked some skills in a certain field and they'll send me resources to learn more. Um, so it's always a chance for you to uh, delve deeper into a field that you might be interested in um, and kind of bulk up on that knowledge. So again, worst they can say is no. I'm not going to do anything to you if you apply for a job and you're not fully qualified for it. So it's worth a shot. Uh, look out for referrals. So if you have a friend who's worked at a big company or a company that you're specifically looking at, um, ask them about their internship, but then also don't hesitate to ask them for a referral. A referral can help you get a little farther ahead in the application process because then the recruiting team knows um, and you're somewhat trusted by this person who was a previous intern or employee there. Um, and it's always a great way to also learn more about the company from your friend or family member. Um, and also, again, worst thing they can say is no. So as long as you're polite and um, have interacted with the person before, uh, so you're not asking them out of the blue, um, they're most more than likely going to give you a referral, which will help them. And then when you're interviewing, the most important thing is to show them how you work. So you'll get asked technical questions, but then you also might get asked behavioral questions, so how you would act. Scenario. And so making sure that you outline your thought process, any questions you have, you're open about any challenges you might face and how you want to um, approach them. If you hit a snag and you need to double back and change your approach, they want to know about that. They really want to understand the way you think, the way that you approach problems, the way that you analyze your solution and maybe try to make it better. And so when you're in an interview, especially a technical interview, you want to always be talking. Um, you want to constantly be talking, um, kind of filling the space with how you feel, um, and making sure that they're aware of, again, your thought process. Because that's what they're going to see at the job. And then some things about being a woman in STEM, because I am a woman in STEM. That's how I identify. So imposter syndrome is something that everybody experiences. Imposter syndrome is basically feeling that you um, are not fit to be in that class or in that internship. Um, and a lot of women and minorities have this because they feel like they don't deserve the opportunities they've gotten or where they are. 
Um, I have experienced imposter syndrome literally constantly, even now. Um, and I think something I would just say is that no matter how successful a person is, there always going to be some experiences of imposter syndrome. Um, and the important thing to do with that is to harness it for your own career development. So understanding that you're not going to be the expert in the room, and that's completely okay, but that means that you have so much left to learn. Um, so look at it not as a negative, that you're not fit to be there, that you don't have the skills what it, of what it takes to be there, but instead say, oh, okay, I don't have, I'm weak in this specific field, I could learn more in this specific field, so let me try to branch out, learn from other people, um, take courses, try outside projects in that field, and build on that. Um, because no one's going to be 100% an expert in everything. Um, so it's just harnessing those um, those feelings of being inadequate um, and thinking that you're not good enough and instead using it as a positive tool to build yourself up, um, both professionally, socially, honestly, any capacity doesn't even have to be um, Someone asked if I have ever felt lonely as a woman in STEM. I 100% have. Um, I, in high school, my computer science course was only a third women, which is great, a great statistic, but still only a third women, definitely better. Um, in electrical and computer engineering, it's around the same ratio, around a third of my class is women. Um, and I've also felt like a lot of my male peers don't necessarily turn to me for help, um, or won't always include me in their study group or in their project groups, uh, or will switch out of a discussion course without telling you. Uh, and it hurts, uh, it, it definitely hurts, but I think what is important is to find communities. Um, so whether that's the one other girl in your class, or um, for me, my engineering sorority, or a sorority in general, or um, a women in STEM club, making sure that you build the supportive systems for yourself um is very important and can help combat that loneliness um, because the more connections you build the more you kind of feel like you're you have a place within that um, and it's hard there are always going to be moments where you feel lonely i think that's just a human thing but um making sure they have people to rely on for advice in any capacity uh, and support in any capacity is is critical honestly especially when you're a woman that or a minority that uh, and then I kind of talked about this a little bit on conscious and conscious bias. So there's always going to be uh, those people who <laughs> don't think that you're as smart, won't turn to you for advice on homework, won't choose you as a project partner, anything. Literally, they will find any way to maybe not include you. And this could be something that's done consciously because they're just a jerk of a person or unconsciously because they, uh, society tells them that women have typically are not as strong in STEM fields. Um, and I think in this regard, education is important. Um, so especially if it's done by a family friend or a, close, a person who's close to you, who you trust, uh, call them out. I've, I've called people out when they interrupt me, when they question my ideas more than they've questioned a male coworker's ideas. Um, and obviously I have the privilege to do so because I'm a relatively loud white woman. Um, but it's important to make sure that they're aware of their faults. They're aware of how they're treating other people and how they're treating you unequally, um, whether they're conscious of it or not. And if you call them out and they don't change, go to um, whatever societal system you can to actually implement the change. So for me, um, I had a professor who was pre-sexist in the classroom. He was a finance professor, but still. Uh, and I emailed him. He was not receptive to my criticism of him being sexist. And I emailed my Title IX coordinator. I told her I do not feel comfortable in the classroom. And she and the administration uh, met with the professor to change his curriculum. Change his curriculum. Um, I'm, again, lucky enough to have that. Not every school has a responsive um, task force or part of their administration to handle um, bias or discrimination. But um, it's important to utilize those tools if you are comfortable to do so, um, because it'll make sure that future people are not hit by this conscious or unconscious bias. Uh, and then there's also the double bind. Uh, so the thing about women is that 
you're typically perceived as having to be both soft and nurturing. Um, but then when it comes to STEM, you have to be kind of brash, bossy, assertive. Um, and so on one hand, there's the feminine connotation of being like soft and nurturing, right? Um, you have to, you're the team worker. You might be the person to make cards on someone's birthday for your team or organize meetings or take notes. So more feminine attributed tasks. But then you're an engineer. You are, um, supposed to present to executives you're supposed to come up with design ideas um, you're supposed to kind of speak your minds in meetings um, and so the double bind is being perceived as uh <laughs> as bossy or as being a bitch uh to put it bluntly um because there's this um kind of clash between the interpretation of how society sees a woman and then also how society sees a and so that's something I struggle with all the time. I struggle with being loud. I struggle with speaking my mind. Um, I struggle with wanting to be the person who organizes team events. Um, but I don't want to do too much work for that. And I, I want to focus on my job as an engineer. Um, and so it's, again, similar to imposter syndrome. It's something that you're constantly going to be um, faced with. It's going to be hard to see yourself as both um a team worker collaborator but then also an engineer um when it comes to the way that society views it and so kind of similar to bias you need to call it out if you see yourself doing more female uh, stereotypical tasks call out your boss be like hey don't want to do that why can't brad do it um and you see that someone's talking over you in a meeting when they haven't done that to steve just be like hey why did you do that i don't understand I have the same idea or um, it's, it's again, calling them out, making them aware of it. Um, and then eventually we might get to a point in society where um, any person, regardless of their identity, will be perceived and treated the same way within the field of engineering or any field in general. Uh, but that's something that I struggle with. Um, I've, I'll go really quickly through this because it's a little past nine. Um, but I've kind of touched on a little of these things, so lessons that I've learned. Uh, so focusing on inner confidence, uh, it's obviously great to get feedback from people, um, incorporate that and improve on yourself, but sometimes you have to take a step back and focus on what's important to you. Um, and at the end of the day, you're responsible for yourself, right? Um, so making sure that you keep your confidence um, in the forefront and you make sure that you keep your time and effort at the forefront. Um, is really critical to make sure that people don't walk over you, they don't ask too much of you, and that you make sure that you stay uh, physically and mentally healthy, especially in times of stress like this. Um, embracing failure. Uh, failure is something that constantly happens. I, for example, I, I wrote a blog post about it, but I didn't get an internship offer after Microsoft. I didn't get a return offer. Um, and that's something that most interns expect is getting a return offer. But I learned from that failure by kind of identifying maybe why there is a miscommunication about me not getting a return offer. And I, I eventually learned from it, have turned it into a role at Lyft. Um, and it's just like the thing that I want to emphasize here is that success is not linear. You're going to make a lot of mistakes along the way. It's a lot of twists and turns. What you need to do is take those mistakes, take those failures, and learn from them analyze what you could have done better what other people around you could have done better and change the system um, learn more educate yourself um, and recognize that every time you make a mistake or have a failure um, you're growing your career because um, if you never failed if any inventor that we uh, talk about grandly in terms of society like if thomas edison or um, elon musk or grace hopper if none of them failed, they wouldn't be where they were. They wouldn't have gotten to the point of the career that they were at. Um, but because they constantly experienced fa failure, they knew that they had to constantly be learning and growing in order to be the best engineer um, and best person. Seeking mentorship, so making sure to reach out to teachers, professors, people at the local companies, whether you work for them or not, um, family, friends. Um, it's always important to have people that you can use as your support system, that you can uh, bounce ideas off of, that you can ask for advice. 
uh, I've asked my professors for advice when it came to choosing between Qualcomm and another company or Microsoft and Lyft and uh, classes to take and whether I should do a master's. And obviously you're going to make these decisions yourself. You're going to be the last person to make the decision, but hearing other people's takes on it and their opinion based on their own experiences, their own careers is invaluable. Um, and I could not stress this enough. It's, it's just important to have a mentor because they're always someone who you can rely on both for advice, but then also just to hear you out um, and to give a second or third opinion on a decision you made or a situation you experienced. Uh, kind of similar to that, the finding your support system. I mentioned, especially as a woman in STEM, it's easy to feel lonely. So becoming friends with that other female and, or women, female identifying engineer in your class or um, finding a club on campus for people that you identify with. Um, doesn't necessarily have to be for engineering or not, but just making sure you kind of have your inner circle of people to rely on um, is important. For me, that's my sorority. For me, that's the girls I, my girls who code class with. Um, I know that if I reach out to any of them, they're always willing to look over my code or to let me vent about something or to give me their opinion um, and be honest with me. Uh, and that's something that every person really needs, but especially minorities in STEM, just because you will experience more uh, bias and oppression because the fact that you're a minority in STEM. And uh, take caring, taking care of yourself physically and mentally, especially now, especially during this pandemic, during this uh, social unrest for the, the Black Lives Matter movement, it's always important to make sure physically you're staying uh, healthy, you are sleeping, you are trying to exercise, uh, which might be difficult if you can't leave your house, but trying to stay healthy, trying to eat well, um, making sure mentally you have friends to talk to, you're not overworking yourself. Um, if you have mental issues, you're talking to a therapist. Um, because otherwise, at the end of the day, if you're not taking care of yourself and your body, you're going to experience burnout. Um, and there's this misconception that burnout, that working, <laughs> that burning both ends of the candle is something that en every successful engineer needs to do. 100% not true because there's going to be a point where your brain breaks. For me, I that happened sophomore year. I would go to bed at 3 a.m. Uh, and wake up at 7 because I was taking way too many classes. And there came a point where I literally could not understand English. I was so tired. Uh, and I only speak English, so I was very concerned. Um, and so that's when I realized that taking care of myself, making sure I had enough time to sleep and hang out with my friends, in addition to my work, um, was critical. Uh, so don't ever let someone force you to overwork or give you, uh, make you have to drop what you think is important um, in terms of like hobbies, spending time with family and friends, or just like the physical needs to have to sleep. Um, because you need to take care of yourself at the end of the day in order to make sure you can go on to the next day and continue to be successful in whatever endeavors you want to pursue. Um, and then lastly, I think this is a very relevant thing uh, considering the Black Lives Matter movement and how um, people, uh, particularly the people of color, have been systematically oppressed. Um, and so for me, I'm a white woman. I have privilege, as I mentioned, and I'm trying to reach out to my fellow uh, women, or women, especially women of color, to make sure that they feel comfortable, to make sure they, have, they know they have someone to talk to. Um, but then I'm also trying to do my best to educate myself on racial injustice, to uh, donate money or fundraise um, to support these causes. Um, and especially, given that I'm one of the minorities in STEM, I'm a woman in STEM, it's important to make sure that you stand up for uh, other women in STEM who are people of color or just people in color in general, um, because there's so many intersectional identities and they all have different levels of discrimination and oppression against them. And if you're not using your platform or your voice to fight for them, to fight for an equitable society, uh, then you're kind of low-key part of the problem. Um, so whether it's something as small as educating yourself and reading articles and listening to podcasts or having conversations with your family and friends about racial injustices or being able to donate money or volunteer, everything helps. 
um, and everything is a step forward in the right direction. So just making sure that you understand you have some, some amount of privilege, some amount of power, um, and you have the right to put it to good use um, is very important, especially now. Um, so thank you so much. I'm a couple minutes over, um, but it's been amazing talking to all y'all. Um, you feel free to follow me on social media at Coder Caitlin. You can email me at kaylinstanton44 at gmail.com or visit my blog, which I don't really post on, but eventually will. Um, I very much enjoy speaking to people about my experiences with the woman in STEM and how I've gotten to where I am today and what I've learned along the way. Um, and I hope that you all have gained something from this. Uh, I don't know how much time people have to stay, but I'm more than happy to answer any questions if people have any. Uh, but again, thank you so much for giving me your time. Um, and I hope you have a great rest of your Sunday weekend. Yeah. Uh, Okay, so I noticed a couple questions in the chat. I'm going to try to answer them. Um, so how did you deal with frustration being a beginning beginner programming learner? Um, you're always going to be frustrated. I think even as an expert programmer, it's something that you're never going to, <laughs> you're always going to have bugs that you want to fix. You're always going to have issues uh, that you're facing. Um, I typically would talk to someone else about it. I would walk through my code. Um, and if there was another person, I uh, would talk to an inanimate object. Uh, so my computer science teacher had a tiny little duck in his classroom. And I found that talking to this duck uh, helped me walk through my code in a more um, calm sort of way not me banging my hand, my hands on the keyboard trying to solve it kind of way. Um, because talking to another person I think kind of calms me down. So I'd recommend doing that. Um, what are some tips for being less nervous and more prepared for interviews? Uh, practice, do a lot of interviews. I think uh, I've never walked into an interview without being nervous, but I think that's good because it shows that you're not complacent. Um, so, just honestly practice, because again, the worst they can say is no, the worst they can do is turn you down. And even if it is your dream career, it at least you went through that process and you could potentially um, learn more from it. I would recommend uh, studying the night before. Um, so if you're doing a coding interview, maybe reviewing some coding questions. Um, if you're doing an electrical and computer engineering interview, maybe review some circuit concepts. Basically review the stuff that your resume indicates that you would know. Um, because those are probably the questions that they're going to ask you, or those are the questions they're going to hear you for. I also am a big proponent of going to sleep on time the day before your interview, um, whether you have a lot of work for school or not, um, just because kind of on the, in the same vein of keep, taking care of yourself, um, a good night's sleep makes sure that you're well rested for your interview. Um, and yeah, I, and then also understanding that your interviewers are people too. They're also going to understand if you make mistakes. And the important thing about thinking through your process is that they can see that even though you make mistakes, you're able to maybe double back, uh, change your answer. And uh, yeah, that's always really important because they don't expect you to get everything right. They expect you to um, be able to explain yourself very well. Um, would you recommend putting free courses you complete on college applications? Yes, I would, because why not? I mean, uh, it shows that you completed it. It shows that you have a certain skill um, or have a certain focus. And if it's relevant, uh, I would definitely recommend putting it. I, I, for example, am taking a Yale course on the science of happiness. Not super relevant to my job as an engineer, so I probably wouldn't put it on. Um, but my machine learning or my self-driving course I would definitely include them. Um, so now it's a little, it's 9.15, so I'm going to sign off. But again, if you, any of you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. It's been great um, talking to you all, I guess, virtually. 
and yeah, again, thank you so much. Have a great rest of your night or day. Um, and yeah, again, feel free to contact me. But thanks, guys.